The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's Brian, Miss Berlin, and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. Hi. Hey. Oh, man. It's been a long week. I actually didn't have a weekend yes. last week. Yeah. Well, yes. Every, uh, uh, the days are, are flying All by. All the weeks are long now. Yeah. And yeah. it's like Monday, and then it's like blink, and it's, oh, it's Thursday afternoon. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Yep. So... Uh, Mr. Betcher, how you been? I'm going to go to you first because Miss Berlin actually has something outside of, you know, our, our news that we're going to do this week. <laughs> how, how has work been yeah. for you? Have you well, had any incident responses or anything that are of interest? Of interest? Well, none that I can talk about, but yeah, I've had some. Oh God. Um, re- you know, just the, uh, I had a. Let's see, a Trojan, which was actually a coin miner slash Trojan. That was pretty cool. Really? Ooh. So, yeah, they get in and they and and they actually used um, that. There's a tool called Not My Fault. Many of you, many of our listeners have heard of it called Not My Fault. And it actually seg faults your machine so you can test um, certain security type things. Uh, and it and it uses not it uses it does a DLL hijack on not my fault, which I is see. pretty awesome. Okay, uh, I thought that was a brilliant. Uh, huh, piece of that's super malware. interesting. Yeah, so not my fault is you know it's it's a regular tool, mm-hmm. um, and um, so so they put that on there and then they put their own malicious DLL and none of the um, you know, virus total had zero hits on the DLL and, and, you know, all that stuff. And then, but then when I uploaded it to our virus company through a private, you know, upload, they analyzed it and they flagged it. Mm. And then, um, then it started to get on virus total after that, a couple of days later. It was pretty oh, cool. Wow. Okay. And, and this not my fault is like add on yeah. software to these Trojans. No, they just use it to put on there as a dummy to oh, execute. Okay, okay. And that and that um, allows the DLL to get loaded, which is actually the thing that's malicious. I see. Okay. Wow. All right. Yeah. So not not my fault is like the malware analysis tool. Or exactly. no? Yeah. Okay. Well, it yes, it is the security tool. Right. That okay. uh, researchers would use to to. Uh, you know, create a blue screen and stuff like that. Yeah. So this is a good guy tool being used by bad guys to help introduce malware onto a system. Yeah, it's pretty odd. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then that, that, that goes back to what we were talking about with Mick Douglas. It's like, you know, there's good guy tools and there's bad guy tools and everything is really a bad guy tool. It's just how you use it. So in the hands of one person, it's yes. a good tool. And in the hands of another, it's a pretty crappy tool. So... Well, I'm sorry you're having issues. Uh, you know, I, I would I would hope it was oh, no, something that's part of the job. It's it's kind of fun, but uh, yeah, that was the coolest uh, malware I've seen in a while. Okay, um, just because it was a Trojan that could do pretty much anything that the attackers wanted and mine coins. It was one of the features of it. So that's that's pretty cool. Any any particular then, um, any particular coin in. Like, are we talking like Dogecoin or Litecoin or is it oh, Bitcoin? Probably, probably, I, I don't know. I don't know which coin it was. Probably Ethereum, maybe. Oh, okay. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, man, <laughs> school from home really sucks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that starts tomorrow for me. That starts tomorrow for me. Uh, and <laughs> my, my daughter has to be up. Uh, wow. At eight fifteen in the morning for her no, first I, class. I feel sorry for these kids, you know, that that have to. They need to get with their friends, and uh, it's it's sad. It's um, it's necessary, but my kids know, are going in. Yeah, 
Good. Yeah, I got some friends yeah, in but Florida. The younger two go to a smaller, a super small school. There's only, I don't know, 40, 50 kids in the whole school, K through eight. Uh, yeah. So they can they can really distance everybody distance. well. Yeah, they like set up classes in the gym and the cafeteria. Mm. So everybody is like super spread out. Right. So. It, it might work. I can't uh, really do that in a public school. I have a I have a couple of friends on Facebook. Their kids are in Florida, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna we're happy to go back to tenth grade." And I'm like, "Yeah, give it a week and a half, and they'll be they'll be doing Zoom." <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, they'll be back to mm-hmm. Zooms." Uh, yeah, my my daughter starts tomorrow, and she is very not happy because she was expecting to go, and the school board was all like, "Yes, here's how we're gonna do the modified schedule, and you're gonna go two days a week or whatever." And I was like, "Honey, you're not gonna go back to school." They they. They're setting you up for, fa- and about two weeks after mm-hmm. I said that, they sent the emails like, maybe we don't go back to school. And I was like, duh. So yeah, I apologize. <laughs> I'm not making light of it. I think it sucks. If you've got 12 kids or, you know, yeah. a bunch of kids at home and you have to work, it definitely sucks. Um, and I, I sympathize with you. So, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I've got I've got coworkers that are working, you know, two to eight PM in the you know, the afternoons and the wife or the the spouse is taking the six AM to two PM route so they, you know, can switch yeah. off with the ch- kids and stuff. So completely understand. Yeah, so, I know a lot of people doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So well, um Yeah. Um I, I just feel sorry for the kids. It's a different world. Right. And uh yeah, it's hopefully mm-hmm. we'll get through it back to normal soon. Yeah. Yeah, um, me too. Yeah, it's yep. crazy. It's crazy. Yep. So, so Miss Berlin, you took a class at Wild West Hacking Fest. Is that was that the Far West Wild West Hacking Fest, or is it the one that started in uh, it's Deadwood? It's just through them. Well, it's just through them, like as a thing, like Black Hills and them. Okay. Like offer classes all the time, kind of now. Oh. Um, not just during their conferences. Okay. Nice. And. Holy crap! Was it worth the money? <laughs> what What was it called? What, what was it? Um, Reaching the cloud. Okay. Uh, so it was um most like ninety percent at least attack, um on. We did most mostly Azure, and um, AWS. Uh, stuff and it was uh, Bo Bullock, so Daft Hack, um, on Twitter. Mm-hmm. He taught it. And it was for four days in a row, four hour spans and um, a lot of hands on stuff, a lot of really, really good information. He's a phenomenal teacher. Um, and I had hooked, uh, somehow he got into contact with like my COO and wanted to work with us on stuff. So I talked to him the week before the class um, about logging the stuff out. Mm hmm from the cloud when we're doing our labs and stuff so i was able to get all the logs from uh azure and google during the stuff that we were doing not aws because it's for our stuff that's yet to be built nice um but i was able to pull all that kind of stuff out and i mean more than half of it was azure so wow uh, that that part was kind of cool like as people are like attacking and trying to do stuff like I'll just attack once and let it work and then go and look at the logs for a while. <laughs> hmm. And, and um, how long so, did this, yeah, uh, it, was, it was super, you, I'm sorry, you said it was a four hour class and then four hour break or what, what was no, the four hours per day? Oh, okay. Okay. So it was like 10, like, uh, so the, uh, like noon to four. Oh, four nice. Okay. Last week. Yeah. And, and like, at, I talked to my boss about it and I'm like, I pretty much didn't do much other work that week <laughs> right? <laughs> because, you know, you're prepping for labs and you're trying stuff again before and after. And like, I, my brain was fried after, after all that. Cause I'm not a, I'm not an offensive person. I right. mean, I'm an offensive person, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not great at red teaming. So right. uh, it, it's a learning curve for me, I think. Cool. And uh, these these are generally well priced. They're not expensive. Yeah, I think it was like. Crap, I have to look. I feel like it was. 800 bucks or something, maybe. That's not awful. 
I don't know. No, I know it wasn't super. I mean, my work paid for it, so I'm not. Right. I can't remember. I bought it a long time ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, Bow Bullock, um, Black Hills yeah, Infosec. Was... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me see. Oh, it looks like okay. some of the videos are online too. Uh, Black Hills Infosec. Yeah, they do. Club. They do webcasts too. Like Jeremy and I did a webcast, um, a couple weeks ago about our training, and over a thousand people registered. <laughs> no kidding. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, a thousand people registered. There's like 600 people watching it. Oh, damn. It was the biggest. And like for anybody that watched it, we didn't prep at all. (laughs) Well, don't say that. Uh, Like, I mean, we prepped, but like, because we we have like two days worth of slides and they're like, could you give like a one hour webcast like on it? So we just like copied those slides over and ripped out like most of it. Nice. Um. And then just had like an hour's worth instead of the full two days. That's cool. Okay. So the uh, the one mm-hmm. you just did with Bo Bullock, it was three hundred ninety five bucks. It was over four days for four hours, oh, and um, that's that's great. Hell, I could almost pay for that out of pocket. Their uh, trainings, like they are killing it with their their prices for training. Yeah, it says it was sold out. So they might have. It says they click here to sign up for this training at November like- Secure West Virginia conference. So they're giving it again in November uh, for three hundred ninety five bucks. There was around two hundred people in the class. Okay. Let me let me put this Damn. in our show notes. If you're interested right? in this class again for Secure West Virginia, uh, you can have. That class, and I think there was several others that are happening during that time as well. Let we're, me see. We're giving ours too. Okay, fantastic. Uh, let me see. Uh, active defense and cyber deception with John Strand. Advanced network threat hunting with Chris Brenton. Applied purple teaming with Kent Ickler and Jordan Drysdale. Modern web app pen testing with Brian King and attack emulation and red team atomic red team with Darren and Carrie Roberts. And then your. Uh, uh, threat hunting D and D. but it, yeah. Okay. Yep. Very nice. Yeah, all of them are three hundred ninety five bucks. So there you go. Uh, if you're interested in some of those, there are links in the show notes. Uh, and Miss Berlin will definitely be uh, giving her link out for her class. Uh, uh, if it won't be in the show notes before I rec- uh, post this, so there you go. It'll be on. It'll be on uh, Secure WV's site. Okay. Um, we're already on Wildwest Hacking Fest site. Okay. Uh, we we were able because we switched around some of our lab stuff. We dropped the price. Awesome. Um, it was two thousand, and we got to drop it to twelve hundred. Okay. Yeah, there's several on the on the Secure West Virginia site. Cool. Uh, all right. Cool. Um, all right. Mm-hmm. So, um, my week went very well. Apparently, I'm a thought leader now. Uh, Ooh. No, don't, don't ooh me. It's uh, so patronizing. <laughs> so I was supposed to do this thing in Vegas. All right, I've been pushing off that title at work. So. Oh, gods, yeah. I, I was supposed to do this conference in Vegas in August, uh, the IWC, which International Wireless Consortium Expo. Supposed to be a panel, a uh, panelist on IoT and supply chain security. So you know, it was it was well it was well received. People enjoyed it, uh, you know, and it helped that we had Alan Friedman on a couple of weeks ago talking about software bill of materials because it went right into my talk about you know how you're supposed to secure your supply chain and and, and help out with that. Uh, the problem was being virtual. It was like, oh yeah, you record it you 10 to 15 minute blurb. And then, you know, there's another room where you can go to do questions. Well, there were so many technical issues on the first day and our class and our talk was at five to 6 PM East coast time on a Monday. So of course nobody was there. Uh, they had so many technical right. issues that nobody showed up for the questions afterwards. Uh, not nobody, but we only had like one guy and he asked a couple questions um, about, uh, some various things that weren't even having anything to do with IOT. Um, and they're not going to share those videos because you have to pay to get them. And I'm a thought leader uh-huh. now, so it's great. Um, so <laughs> it's about the worst it could possibly be. Um, I'm hoping that they'll ask us back again next year and it'll be more of an in, in person thing. 
Uh, but uh, it was good to to you know get outside of the echo chamber. There's a lot of folks there that need a lot of help understanding that stuff, and there's a lot of folks who speak at those kinds of conferences that could use a dose of perspective. It's almost like, you know, you're in academia for all of your life and you don't really know what's going on out in the real world. And you're kind of in an echo chamber, yeah. kind of like how InfoSec is. So um, I, I went to that <laughs> echo chamber. Amazing how that works. <laughs> I went to that echo chamber and uh, it was, it was kind of a different discussion uh, about a lot of the same stuff. Uh, and yeah, so mm -hmm. um, it was, it was interesting. Uh, I hope, I hope that I don't end up in the same boat as those folks, uh, you know, in terms of technical discussion in the future. But uh, yeah, I, I, I did my New Year's resolution and uh, uh, hope that it will uh, lead to more speaking opportunities uh, in that in that uh, arena. So um, it can only help, you know, Very bringing cool. real infosec people right. to the to the you know to the masses. So uh, and then. Uh, not Monday, uh, the, the previous weekend, I did this ad card class, which was from ProSci um, on organizational and enterprise change management. And that was really good. So good. In fact, I suggested we do the. That's why you're asking all the questions about change management stuff. Oh, That's yeah, why. yeah, yeah. Um, so ad car is an acronym for awareness. Good resource. Yeah, it is uh, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. And the whole point is, and, and, you know, I, I'm in this class and I'm watching this and I'm like, wow, okay, this is why a lot of the things that I've been trying to get to happen at work fail because, you know, I'm taking it all on myself to try to get these changes made, this process implemented, you know, these, these various fixes in place and, and it's failing and I didn't know why. And there's a, there's a lot to that. And some of that we'll be discussing on the 3rd of September, uh, probably a whole month of September and a little bit more in our book club. And uh, there's a link in the show notes to where you can buy the book. You can either get the Ted dead tree edition or you can get the Kindle edition. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk through all the different versions, A, D, K, A, and R, uh, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement and talk about uh, sponsors, why sponsors are important, who should be the sponsor in a project. Uh, hint, it's not necessarily you. Um, uh, communication from the sponsors, an engaged sponsor, uh, according to this uh, ProSci company, who it's a, it's a resource org. 70% uh, of projects uh, exceed their goals with an engaged sponsor. And that could be like your boss or your boss's boss or whatever. But a lot of times if you've ever implemented something and it was kind of half-assed and you're like, oh, well, this could have gone better. Perhaps a lot of it is communication and how your sponsor communicated it or didn't communicate it or you know, got involved and threw their weight behind it, uh, et cetera. So uh, we're going to talk about that. I think we're going to get one of the authors of one of the books that I got online, uh, Tim, Tim Creasy, I think, from ProSci. Uh, the other guy uh, sold his part of the company. He's no longer involved. But we're going to try to get them on. Uh, to, to talk about uh, organizational change management. So, um, you know, for those of you who are popping shells, you may think it's not important, but you're going to get to a point in your career where you're going to be like, damn, I, I, I'm tired of popping shells and, you know, I want to manage the talent or the people who are popping shells because I want to do that or, you know, I want to, you know, get higher up in my career. Uh, and, and some of these things will help because then you know how to play the game. So uh, if you're interested in joining, it's not a long book uh, since we did the packed publishing book with pen testing and AWS and it took like 48 weeks to get done. Uh, we thought we'd try something a little shorter, a little less technical. So uh, there's a link in the show notes to, to the Amazon link to where you can buy that in Kindle or, or Dead Tree format. And uh, yeah, hope, uh, hope you can join us. All right. So I know it sounded like an ad. You know, the class is four thousand dollars. It's like sans <laughs> expensive. Um, Holy crap. It it's okay though. You can read the book and get enough out of it that you don't need the certification class. Uh and to be fair, the the test was super easy. It was like open book, <laughs> ask the teacher if you have any questions what? about the book. I mean, seriously, it was like, you know, uh, yeah. So if anything, it'll make you a better PM or, uh, it'll help you understand the game and the rules, uh, to hack the game, if you will. So anyway, I digress. Uh, so this week we're gonna do a little news, uh, cause we've done a ton of interviews over the last 
10, 15 weeks. So we really have. Yeah, we, we did a lot, had, uh, a lot of interviews. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, more coming up too. Yep. So first on our list is from Bleeping Computer. It says TLS Cert Life is going. You have two days left to purchase a two-year TLS SSL certificate. Mr. Betcher, you said you were reading that one. Or no, no you were reading the Garmin one. Reading the other. One. Right, the Garmin one. We'll talk about the Garmin one. So I, I picked this one because I was like, oh, uh, I didn't realize that they had actually lowered it. I've, you know, back in my day, uh, TLS mm-hmm. certs were like seven years old or something, you know, and now they're yeah, down to two. Exactly. And now uh, apparently Apple said, yeah, I we're only going to allow one year plus a month. Can you get a 10? A 10 year? God. Or was that just domain registration? That it may be domain reg. I think you're. I think. I think I misspoke. I think that might be domain registration. I know you can buy up to a ten year domain registration. Um, but I do Is remember there. Ever ten? Uh, like certs? Maybe I do remember there being some certs that Mr. Betcher and I worked at a place before that we had like five year certs. Yeah, they were very I, long. Okay. Uh, I remember doing five year wildcard certs. Yes. That, that, I think that's what it was. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much what it was. <laughs> Uncomfortable. <laughs> Anything for this domain is signed. Yeah. Great. Great idea. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, apparently Apple said, yeah, we're not going to do that and we're not going to allow that anymore. And then the, behold the power of apple and they uh, they made them so now everything is a year and a month so you get 397 days of tls goodness out of your cert before you uh, have to re-up it and i and i think let's encrypt did something very similar as well it was like you can you know get a free tls cert for a year or something like that um, they, they honestly the biggest issue with that is everyone forgets right and that's where you need to right? put in a so like I just think part of the TLS process should involve a calendar entry. (laughs) Oh, right. Congratulations. Here's your TLS cert. And here's a reminder on your calendar. You can't import that (laughs) until you put this on your calendar. Wow. Right. That would be nice. (laughs) Make an API call from your calendar to your web server with the... Right. Congratulations. You've done everything necessary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It would be awful to forget that stuff when you. And I, you I mean, know, how many times? How many? How many times have you done it? Because I've done it. Probably I, at least ten. I think I've done it a couple of times. I know our podcast website is SSL enabled or TLS enabled, and it expires in November. And I think that was a two-year cert. So I'm going to have to go back and figure out with Libsyn on how to get my get our cert in, enabled properly. Um, you know, the, the... I had to rebuild my web server. <laughs> really? How come? <laughs> Cause I also had a version of Python that it wouldn't let me up. Oh no. PHP that it wouldn't let me like I had upgrade. Yeah. That's a whole story. Is it but, WordPress? Yeah, it was, it was easier just to roll a new website and restore from back up. cards. Yeah. Yeah. It was all that damn TLS. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. So, so Apple has, uh, you know, Apple did a good thing. Uh, even though it does make it more of a pain for other folks, uh, according to according to Bleeping Computer's article here, it says gla- allows greater agility when phasing out certs when vulnerabilities are discovered in encryption algorithms, limits a website's exposure to compromise as uh, private encrypted keys would be changed regularly. If a private TLS cert is stolen, one year validity will limit the amount of time a threat actor could use it, and it prevents hosting providers or third parties from using a cert for a long time after a domain is no longer used or switch providers. So that, that's great. I mean, those are all positives. Um, yeah, so they said CAs, though, wanted nothing to do with the change and kept pushing back. Weird. Right? I don't... That is weird, isn't it? I mean... Sure about that? Well, that according to the article, that's what it says. Yeah, I mean, you would think that they would want... Because, I mean, they make the money, right? Right, right. Everything gets signed like, by them. So, yeah, every year you're coming back to get change, more CERD. Wink. Right. <laughs> 
Oh. <laughs> this is a reverse psychology thing. Yeah. Oh. They probably yeah. paid Apple to make that rule. Yeah. They've been trying to do it for years yeah. and nobody will do it. <laughs> you imagine the imagine the conversation between VeriSign and Apple. I'm just going to leave these couple suitcases full of money on your desk, <laughs> Mr. CEO of Apple. And if they aren't here when I get back. Uh... So, yeah, no, that, make, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, they say after Apple made the decision, Mozilla and Google came on and said they'd be following the lead. This decision ultimately forced CAs to begrudgingly agree to the change in maximum validity periods. So, yeah. Um, da -da -da. Others are stopping it at the end, 31 August 2020. So you've got till tomorrow, basically, to buy. Tomorrow being 31 August. This is 30 August today. Uh, That's why their stock went up so much. Yeah, I'm going to get my uh, hedge fund buddy to buy 6 million shares if you... Uh... Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's really important, though, to uh, to do to have that set up uh, with a reminder. You know, Miss Berlin was joking about the email uh, reminder or whatever, but apparently they say administrators forgetting to renew certificates led to outages, including a Spotify outage. Oh, God, what... People can't listen to their music. Arg. Uh, and or an under. I, mean, I would probably be mad if Spotify went down. I don't. Depending on what I was doing. Yeah, I don't use them. So uh, I don't like the algorithms. One thumbs up and I end up with nothing but damn Beatles music on my on my channels and stuff. I, I don't know. I'm old. I, yeah, whatever. And also led to an underreporting of COVID-19 cases in California. So there's probably some kind of Department of Health website that went down. So um and they do remind everyone that Let's Encrypt does an automated approach for free certs and EFF cert bot to automate installation and renewal. So there are options if you don't want to, you know, go the route of a CA. Uh, Let's Encrypt does have uh, free certs if you uh, if you need them. Um, but sometimes sometimes you need a, a you know a, a more legit I would say more legit for for whatever reason so Digicert or the 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 Verisigns or you know whoever's the Komodos are out there to that can uh, hook well, you I up with that. I gotta say this: if if you find yourself with an expired cert, just all of a sudden, either you're not scanning or you're not looking at the scan results because uh, those scanners will detect that and alert you, Hey, your search's about to run out. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's that. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think Nessus did have a plugin at one time that would tell you, you have 270 days left on your certificate or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, make sure, you know, the the one thing is though it's like uh no you don't have two days left you shouldn't be using two year certs anyway uh because then it'll be what th what 365 times two you'll have 700 odd days before you have to remember that again um you know as long as you set a reminder you're not gonna work there anymore you know right and, you know, as long as you set a reminder, you know, a month in advance and go, hey, you know, we need to get this updated, then you should be fine. Just make sure you send that reminder to more than one person in case you happen to not work there anymore in a year. They don't forget. So cool. All right. Thanks, Lawrence Abrams, for that article. All right. Next one. Ms. Berlin, was that one yours? The, the uh, FBI ransomware gigafactory... Nevada uh, one? I think it was all of ours combined. Okay. You talked about it. I found it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I read this one. Uh, it's from Electrek, but uh, I'm sure other news story. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a Russian national uh, went to Nevada and tried to bribe a Tesla employee. Uh, it has now been identified as Tesla. The DOJ originally said a computers, a, a company in Nevada, if you will. Right. Um, and uh, somebody disclosed that it was, in fact, at the Tesla Gigafactory there. Um, met the employee, who remains anonymous, several times socially before making him, so it actually is a him, a proposition to pay him a million dollars to add malware to the internal computer system. Like, how do you, how do you bring up that topic, right? It was just like... <laughs> randomly bump into the other russian-speaking person at the bar 
Oh, speaking of suitcases full of cash, right? No, I, I think <laughs> I think this guy um, originally declined. Uh, maybe they were trying to do it online with some Bitcoin or something mm. like that, and he said, "No, I'm not going to do it." So then the Russian had to fly to the states, oh. maybe to hand him some cash hmm. and try break and get his him kneecaps. To do it. I don't know. Seems like Something a like Russian that, thing. Yeah. See, the, the 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 person was targeted though, right? So there had to be something. There had to be something that the Russians thought would be the apple. You know, there there was some incentive that made them think that this person was bribe worthy. And yes. you know, I thought they were both Russian. Uh, it just says 27 year old Russian citizen and then an unnamed source or an un- unnamed, uh, uh, employee. employee. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for some reason I thought the employee yeah. was Russian. Maybe no, I read that wrong. <laughs> no, maybe they were, you know, it could be a number of things. They just thought that that would be a, uh, somebody who would be willing to take the cash. Right. 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 Oh, and okay. had access to, uh, put the, put the thing in. Cause I know, it, I know why I read it wrong and said, ultimately, I'm going to butcher this. Uh, I'm not even going to say it. The Russian dude and another Russian speaking individual who is not named in the complaint agreed uh, to pay the employee one million. So okay. there was two people involved wow. that were Russian. Okay. Just, and then uh, a third person who's the unnamed right. unnamed Tesla employee. Um, that, that's, a, that's a lot name. of work to get malware onto a network. Why didn't they just email somebody with it? You know? Please I mean, open I'd this. I imagine they'd think that oh yeah true i don't know i mean yeah i mean uh, uh, unless Maybe they tried and failed many times and they decided it's easier you know, it's to fly easier with a thumb to, drive <laughs> it's probably easier just to give this guy a thumb drive and a million bucks yeah you know i uh, i the cost the cost benefit wait a minute there. so when was this because like august 22nd thought, they uh he was arrested yeah. august 22nd trying to leave lax so All right, but like when did he get here because i thought like you're not allowed to travel back and forth right now right oh yeah he could have been here for a year or so or or something yeah i mean the only thing i could think of is perhaps this employee at tesla um you know some way they have their network set up so that it was like super secure the you know, maybe it doesn't accept email incoming or whatever. But I mean, how hard is it, you know, to set up a Gmail account here? Here's the exe or, you know, here's, you know, elfbowling.com or something like that. And <laughs> that's that's old school for those of oh, you. I remember who, elf bowling. I do remember elf bowling. I remember <laughs> running elf bowling in Flash on my computer and then not realizing that there was probably some kind of Trojan in it. But it was damn Definitely. fun. It was damn fun. Definitely Trojan. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a lot of weirdness going on with this one. I mean, uh, yeah, there's IP obviously involved with, with Tesla. Um, but I mean, there's a, I'm hoping, and I think we talked about this before the show. I'm hoping that the, the person who worked with the FBI is getting a nice fat bonus this year because, you know, <laughs> if, if if all he gets is is you know hot cocoa sampler or something for for Christmas, uh, he he he's out a million dollars now. I'm, ethically, yes, he did the right thing, but damn, you know that's he could have brought. I, depending on what the the you know the the problem was there, or what the malware was, potentially save the company billions. Right, yeah. right, right. Because it said. Uh, it, internal computer system in order to extract corporate data and affect Tesla's operations. So that would affect, Oh yeah. You said billions is right because uh, Tesla stock as of September, August 31st is going to split five to one. So if you have one share of Tesla stock, you will have five starting September 1st. Um, I won't talk about mine. Uh, I had Tesla stock back in there. I had yeah, Tesla I stock. About mine either. Yeah, 2011. I was like, oh, it's only $17 a share. It's not going to do me any good. <sighs> I mean, mine paid for my, what I gained on mine paid for my roof. So at least oh, I nice. got something. Yeah. It, it actually costs more right now than Bitcoin. And that's ridiculous. And they're still saying, even after it splits and it goes down to like 450 odd dollars a share, that 
they're still expecting it to rise up to another almost a thousand dollars. So Those Robin Hood kids are going to buy more and more. Right. I right. Think Amazon right? might be next or one of the next. Yeah. What's the old yeah. saying? I used to be a millionaire and then I sold my Tesla stock at 17. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. good, good on that employee. Uh, I don't know if that would be the same everywhere. I'm almost certain that with, uh, that, that big a carrot, you could probably entice anybody in this day and age and this, uh, you know, with all the stuff that's going on with COVID to, uh, to take that million dollars you could probably, you know, go. And so good to, good to, good on the Tesla employee and, uh, you know, whatever, Hopefully, whatever the Russians had on that person uh, was not uh, something that was blackmail worthy, because I would have almost assumed blackmail. But sounds like they they thought he would yeah. be bribe or uh, bribe possible. So, uh, yeah, stalled operations crippled the company. Yeah, that that would have that would have caused the stock to take a dump. And if they had shorted the stock when they uh, you know had launched the malware and caused issues, that would have that would have caused issues. So, um, all right. Next story is from privateinternetaccess.com. Go ahead, Mr. Betcher. Well, this one, uh, they say allegedly that, uh, well, Garmin had a ransomware attack. Okay. And uh, I, I read another article which says that Garmin may have paid $10 million to, um, to get out of that. Now I know a lot of mm. companies. It is far easier to pay the ransom because ransoms were, you know, twenty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars to a large company. That's that's not much mm -hmm. to get out to to decrypt your systems. If it actually if they actually give you the decryption keys, um, it's worth it. But allegedly they paid ten million. That is a lot of money now. A lot of the uh, ransom, you know, we had this whole thing last year where, and the year before, where hospitals were getting ransomed, right? And right. and that was a big deal. They'd have to pay ten thousand or twenty thousand um, dollars for all these hospitals to um, get out of the ransom. And then schools, they were attacking schools last year as well. I, I know one of the school districts about twenty miles from where I live uh, got attacked, and I'm not sure if they paid the ransom or what. And then it was um, police departments and uh, local governments, right, mm -hmm. that were getting attacked. And, and now it's uh, companies. And mm -hmm. they've upped the ante on the ransoms, allegedly. Uh, they're going to start attacking uh, Fortune 500 companies now, right? Because they're, uh, they appear to be just as easy pickings as some of these governments. Right, right. And the, the, the data that uh, they paid to get back was uh you know really detailed information so a lot of these garmin fitness watches have fine gps location tracking on by default because you know you're running or or whatever um miss berlin i think said earlier the the strava um uh controversy that happened a couple of years ago where you know you have, you know, Joe Army guy running in the middle of Afghanistan in a circle around a base that <laughs> right. shouldn't be there. You yeah. Know. Uh, it's like blacked out on Google. <laughs> whoops. My bad. You know, and it's the same thing here. It's like, you know, Garmin data is is down to the nearest meter uh, or three feet uh, to be able to run. You know exactly where these people live, you know, where they go to buy Starbucks, you know, you know, their heart rate, you know, how often, you know, they're doing activities, you know, what time they go to bed, what time they get up, you know, there's everything, everything is involved with this. I mean, my, my withings is that I use for my, uh, my fitness very similar, you know, and there's a lot of information there that can be, can be taken and used, uh, heart rate information, body fat. I'd say probably more than with just a phone. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. According to an article on C Cyber Security Hub, mm -hmm. it took Garmin four days to release a statement saying that they had that attack had been taken place or that a cyber attack had I taken place. I could see place. that. Four days, though? Maybe they had to confirm know. it? How many? I mean, if, if your systems are encrypted, you're pretty certain within a few hours, right? Maybe I would maybe, think maybe it took them four days to get a new computer so they could issue this. So they could actually post them to their Twitter account. 
Like, where's the password? Oh, no. I don't know. It's encrypted. It's on that computer. Shut <laughs> up, Bill. I can only type so fast on my phone to put out a press release. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to do it for my watch. I can't. <laughs> Hello, computer. Watch is, it's down. Yeah. Hey, Google, post an incident response for me. Oh, crap. <laughs> That's going to do it. It's going to nope, do it. Nope, nope. I, I turned it off before it hit. I turned it off before it hit. Yeah, I have a Google Home Mini that I, the only thing I ask it is weather. It's like, hey, Google, what's weather going to be like tomorrow? That's all I tell, ask it. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, maybe it took a while. So you, Mr. Bretcher, you said that they actually paid the ransom. Uh, well, allegedly, uh, that's according to, see, um, they have some issues Um Let's see. Uh, go ahead and talk, and I'll I'll try to find it here. Okay. Well, my 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 whole thinking was that uh, depending on who the quote unquote bad guy is, uh, could they not get in trouble for paying the ransom, uh, especially to certain countries? I thought that if you were to say send that money to I don't China or you know attacks, yes. they could so get in trouble. Basically, um, it says here, third-party negotiators can act as intermediaries between the hacked and the hackers. It appeared that Garmin paid a cybersecurity firm in New Zealand to assist with the hack, meaning uh, it is likely that they worked as a go-between to legally pay the $10 million ransom without brace, breaking U.S. sanction laws. Okay, yeah. So, so for some reason, if you get a third party to pay the people for you, sure. it's okay. Sure. That Even though the end result is you paid the attackers. Right. Hey. So that's a loophole. That's a loophole. <laughs> well, and they're going to have to close that one eventually. Loophole. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to have to figure out a way to close so, that loophole. Yeah. And then of course, the more companies pay, the more that the attackers have to, I mean, it's like a startup, right? You know, the more money you get that first customer and you're like, yes, we can R and D this sucker. We can make a product better. And then we can get more customers and more customers. Of course, this is, um, you get more, potential hacks in this case and then more people pay and then you have better malware could, to could, deploy could you imagine you know them putting then you out can a, take that uh suitcase full of money to the next one right <laughs> could you imagine you know job description out there for a company and it's a little shady looking they're like we're in the malware business and we're you know expanding our operations and we need security people so you're going to be the CISO of a malware company or something you know uh yeah, that one, that wasn't funny. All right. Um. Anyway, so we'll see ten million dollars. That's ten potential uh, companies they can. There you, you know, go. Try to bribe. That's right. People they can bribe. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you know they could short some stock on a company that makes electric cars, and you know make hundreds of millions of dollars, or you know what have you. So. Yeah. Um, so, well, uh, I guess it's good that the people at Garmin got their, their data back and I hope that, uh, you know, they'll initially see a drop in their stock price, but then, you know, say, oh, we've learned our lesson and we've added real security and then they'll have better stock price this year. So go ahead and invest in Garmin now because it will go up because they've been breached and they've learned their lesson. That was quotey fingers. Um, and, you know, the stock price will go up. So buy now. So you can sell it when it goes up about $5 a share. So, all right. So uh, last story. Last story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I found this one. I found this one today. Uh, it was a, bu a hacker, hackeroni or hacker one report about a remote code exec in Slack. And, uh, there's a write up. It was pretty good. It says with any in app redirect logic slash open redirect HTML or JavaScript injection, it's possible to execute arbitrary code within Slack desktop apps. Uh, hmm. this report demonstrates a specifically crafted exploit consisting of an HTML injection, security control bypass and RCE JavaScript payload. This exploit was tested as working on the latest Slack for desktop for two or 4.2 or 4.3.2 versions of Mac windows and Linux. Uh, so there's a pretty good write-up. There's a link in the show notes if you want to look at the Hackeroni report. It was closed. Um, the bounty for this was $1,750. And uh, the severity was given was critical, 9 or 10, and it was disclosed in full. Uh, and Miss Berlin, I see... It seems it, low. It seems low. For what what seems low? The vulnerability type but, or the severity type or what? No, that that payout, man. Oh. Just think, like since 
uh, you know, business continuity and all with COVID. Right. How many more like pro Slack subscriptions do you think there probably are? They could probably handle a little bit more than 1200 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you're not the only one. Uh, if you go and read the NetSec Reddit uh, comment uh, where I found this post, uh, somebody said, that's really a nice finding. And in my opinion, worth more than 1750 bucks. And then somebody else replied, that's not just your opinion. I'd pay more than 1750 out of pocket. If this wasn't disclosed, it's ludicrous. A company with a cap of market cap of $14 billion can only afford to give a researcher 1750 for a way to compromise the integrity of their primary product. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that it is what it is. Uh, there's, yeah. Maybe, maybe this will spur people to, you know, change. Uh, I think it's good that companies have bug bounty programs, but I think they do need to be somewhat realistic in how much something costs. Maybe, uh, uh, I don't know would it, would a, a fraction of a percentage of the like gross profits or something make more sense. Like, you know, we're going to give you point, oh, gosh. point zero zero one Maybe. of the, you know, the gross or whatever, or, you know, that would be the maximum. So, you know, or a right. hundred thousand dollars, whichever be is cool. better, you know, uh, other than some arbitrary number that someone came up with. Well, at least the guy got paid or the person, sorry, the person got paid. Uh, you know, I've seen other bug bounties where it was like, hey, here's a T-shirt from our store. And you're like, cool, thanks. <laughs> no, I know. Uh -huh. um, I, it depends on how long it took him, or right? Her to, right. Uh, to get this, I mean, if it was, I mean, allegedly seven months worth of work. I I don't know if that's true. Yeah, I I don't I don't know um, if it took seven months either. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. There's seven participants on the on the bounty. Oh, so maybe it was a maybe. It so was they a... had to split seventeen fifty seven ways. <laughs> womp, womp, womp. <laughs> so it look, looks like it was a looks like it was a chain. So it says Slack awarded Ivar Ivar's vids with a two hundred ninety two dollar bounty. Uh, wanted to get this bounty to you. Thank you for the excellent find. Write up was top notch as well. Just wanted to reiterate how much we appreciate your involvement. And then. Oscar SV fourteen hundred for the write up. Yeah, fourteen hundred fifty eight dollar bounty. Yeah, like that's a lot of work to write that shit up. Yeah, yeah. damn. I mean, yeah, I would expect more more than that for just the write up. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there was definitely a chain involved in that uh, creation. So random thought, if if you're ready to switch topics, please let's do that. Okay. What's your thoughts on using bounty? Like you see seven people are involved, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And like, we're looking for backend dev, like a good DevOps back. Like, what do you think the, do, th do people like look through this stuff for uh, like scouting? Hmm. I don't, I don't think for they, talent. That would make sense. I mean, if, you know, maybe you could reach out to, Oscar SV or, uh, you know, Ivar's S vids and find out if they want to be. Well, uh, so there's a difference though. You're looking for somebody who can write code. This is a person that, well, I mean, depending on how much code they actually wrote, but, um, is it the skin? Right? Is it I mean, the a same lot of skill people set? that I know that write code also like doing bug bounties. Oh, uh, I see. Because they know how to write it. They know how it works so they can see kind of the flaws and stuff. Right. Right. So they might not be just like completely exploit driven people. Right. They might actually just be developers that are doing this as a side gig. Yeah. Well, okay. So if your company is looking for a back end developer, are there any restrictions to doing that? Let's say your company wants you to can't hire be an asshole. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. That's like your only restriction. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, to give you an example, I used to work for a company, uh, CrowdStrike. Uh, I've, I've told people this, it's not anything new, but if you listen to a lot of our newer, our older episodes, it's like I worked for a company and I didn't want to tell people who I worked for. But, um, so, uh, at the time we were looking at doing a bug bounty program as well. I think they have one now. I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, we had engaged with, uh, private 
you know, doing a private bug bounty with one of the bug bounty companies. I don't remember which one. Uh, and we told them U S only bug bounty people only because CrowdStrike, nation state actors, APT one, fluffy bear, Fozzie, <laughs> Fozzie Winkles, you know, uh, ap- aptitude aardvark and all them's, you know, um, and go ahead. Oh, sorry. I thought I was going to say that. Anyway, so, you know, we, you know, we set it up and they were like, yes, we're going to do US only testers and whatever. And uh, then we started getting, you know, write ups and things. And, and we, we noticed that there was a couple IP addresses that were coming from some countries that we told them not to come from. And the pen testing was supposed to go over a VPN connection. We were expecting certain IP addresses. And we called out that bug bounty company and they're like, oh, well, you know, sadly, some of our best bug bounty finders work in these countries that rhyme with Russia. And, um, you know, those are, those are where our best bug bounty company, you know, people are from. And we're like, yeah, so we told you Americans only. And uh, they actually removed those people from the bug bounty program uh, because they, there were specific guidelines like you're supposed to use this VPN and whatever. So one thing, if you're doing a bug bounty program and you have restrictions like that, know that maybe you don't always have U.S. American pen test bug bounty finders. Maybe they're coming from all countries in all the world. And if you have restrictions like that, you need to double check and make sure that's the case. Um, if they hadn't broken OPSEC and not I mean, used... Couldn't they come over a VPN anyways? Well, they'll, they're still going to come over the VPN, but uh, if you have restrictions or requirements like, you know, we only re- we're only allowing people from the U.S. or, you know, we're an Israeli-based company. We only want Israeli-based, you know, bug bounty company people or, you know, we're in Indonesia and we only want <laughs> Indonesian bug bounty hackers, you know. Um, you should expect potentially to get any country, not just them. So, I mean, you need to make sure that that's, that's solid, but, um, you could reach out to those folks that got that, uh, that, that $1,750 yeah, thing. Just find out, thought. you know, also, I wonder how many people include that kind of stuff on their resumes. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've been doing at Leviathan is doing the, uh, you know, in our industry, we always complain about the job descriptions. So one of the things I've been doing is, uh, uh, as part of process uh, improvement and maturity at our organization is rewriting job descriptions. And uh, one of the things that I have made sure that I've added is experience with CTF or bug bounty programs as a nice to have, not, not necessarily something mm-hmm. that, you know, we're, and cause I'm trying to work on diversity initiatives and trying to make it so that um, the way that some of job descriptions have been written in the past, not ours, but other ones that I've seen include things like pronouns that shouldn't be in there. Uh, or, you know, this is not really what day to day is for an associate pen tester, you know? So, you know, if we're looking for web pen testers, we should at least mention the fact that there's web application requirements, you know, like you need to know how to use burp potentially or OWASP zap or, you know, tamper, tamper data or something in a browser. Um, so, you know, I've been rewriting those, uh, at Leviathan to make them a little more realistic, uh, getting input from our testers, uh, you know, as wide a range as we can get, um, and to make them so more, let me ask you this. go ahead. Is excellent communication skills, a requirement or a nice to have for that type of job? Uh, I do believe that we, I did put in the, uh, skills, a requirement to be able to explain, risks and findings in a way that the customer will understand them. Because a lot of great hackers, yeah, they can, they can communicate from their computer to the other computer and hack the crap out of it. But right. You know, being able to communicate person to person is a little challenging, right? Right. So just their, or, or just put anything in. Yeah. Or put anything in word, like actual writing. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, like, yeah yeah, yeah. I, i've seen people that are super 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 smart uh, uh with a lot of stuff but right. couldn't draft an email yeah no i mean we <laughs> to save their lives we have that i mean we have we have, i mean we have testers that write and we also have uh reviews that happen on all our reports we have a technical writer that we've hired her name is barbara she's an awesome lady uh, I actually carpooled with her back in the before times, uh, and, uh, she knows her stuff, you know, um, uh, actually had her look at our job description to make sure that I didn't 
I didn't unwrite my English good or whatever. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there are some people, you know, it, it's not just in the writing, it's in the communication. So if you have a readout meeting or something and you go, yeah, we found cross-site scripting and, you know, here's how I managed to reproduce the cross-site scripting vulnerability. And, you know, and when the customer goes, well, okay, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just put in the WAF rule to get rid of semicolon. And then you're like, oh, okay, great. You yeah, know, that's not going to solve the problem you have to help them understand more systemically why this needs to happen. So, um, you know, we, we do that and we try to, to help out the associates and our, you know, and mentor them as, as much as possible to, uh, get there. Uh, usually we have a team of people on, on most engagements, but, uh, it, it's really, it's really helpful to, uh, to, to get those job descriptions in place and to make them realistic and meaningful. So, uh, yeah, you should, uh, you know, write up what a back end you know, Ms. Berlin, did, did you write the job description for the backend developer? I did not. Okay. So is it realistic? I was realistic? told to edit it if I wanted to, but did I you? don't know. I think it's all right. Better. Yeah. Realistic is... Should I read it? I would say yes, because... Uh, we, I mean, I read it, but I did, like, did you find something bad? Oh, no, I hadn't. I hadn't read oh, it. Oh, okay. But my, right. my things would be like, you know, make sure that what they say they're going to be doing is real. Um, cause you know, we hadn't updated ours in a while and there were some things in there that was like, Oh yeah, I must have knowledge of, you know, TCP and, you know, DNS and stuff. And I was like, look, wait, no, no, they don't, they don't need that stuff. We laugh when we see that shit on, on resumes. It's like, Oh, knowledge of TCP IP. I'm like, seriously, everybody has knowledge of TCP, but you know, do I actually use it in real life? So, you know, we, we, we try to make our job descriptions more realistic and that's, that's what I've been trying to help do. So, you know, we have the associate, which is the basic level, and then we have the mid and the seniors. So, you know, the mid is going to have all of the skills of the associate plus this, and then the senior is going to have all of the skills of the associate and the medium plus this. And, you know, so, uh, that's, that's been how I've been working on those, but, um, if anybody has any thoughts or comments on job descriptions, I'd love to hear them uh, on our Twitter. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, uh, oh, you can follow me at uh, Brian Break. And, uh, you know, send me some feedback if you like, yeah, I want to know how to write job descriptions too. And uh, I'd love to, you know, pick your brain. So um, I don't have anything else. I think that was good. I, I appreciate uh, the, the, the hardworking bug bounty people who, uh, you know, can add that now to their resume that I found a remote code exec in this vulnerable version of Slack. And, uh, you know, that's going to hopefully help them with uh, jobs down the line. So, yeah. Um, okay. I don't have anything else. Uh, Miss Berlin, anything from you? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to talk about the our, our feel-good boxes. Feel good. All right. What's that yeah, about? Yeah, so because, uh, so we have a lot of uh, supporters, right? And sponsors that have given us money and we do pretty good um, uh, budgeting, mm -hmm. right? And like right. not overly zealously spending stuff for mental health hackers. Mm -hmm. So we had a bit left over in the bank. You know, we've not traveled anywhere or done anything pretty much this year other than I think we stopped in February. Right. Um, and we've been looking for other things to do, you know, so we've um, done um, uh, like Zoom meetups with people. But other than that, like it's hard. It's hard to find things to do mm -hmm. to help remotely. Right. Um, so I was talking about one of my friends about it and he gets these like man subscription boxes you know where you know he'll get like i think one he got like throwing knives in a plant oh, <laughs> like okay. it's just like ra random right. stuff right and uh so his idea was to do something like that but for mental health okay and so that's what we're doing nice. yeah we put like a a little thing out on twitter uh where you can go and nominate somebody that you think might be struggling or might benefit from it um and then uh, Megan and I went and ordered a crap ton of stuff on Amazon. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. <laughs> so we're going to put, put, yeah, put together some of these boxes. And I think so far we have almost 20 people, uh, that have been nominated by others that we're going to send stuff out to. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, I was talking before the show, uh, Leviathan, my company also does care packages. So I've got a plant, 
I have a cat palm I'm pointing at. You can't see me pointing at it. I'm sorry. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I'm pointing at it. Like people are gonna be like, Oh, that, that yes, plant. Definitely. Okay. Derp. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, yeah, they, they sent me a cat palm cause it's cat friendly. Cause I have cats and they were like, Oh yeah, we can send you a bromeliad. And I'm like, uh, or whatever. And I was like, well, what about my cats? Will it kill my cats if they eat it? Cause the little shits get up there on my printer. And, um, so yeah. And then, uh, the last one they sent us, which worked out really well was uh pink knees cookies. It's a, uh, uh, black owned business here in Seattle and they do, uh, artisan type cookies that are gluten-free, uh, or, uh, non-gluten-free and, those are great. So, um, yeah, if your if your organization is uh, all remote, which most everyone is, uh, maybe you should talk to your HR people, your senior leadership, and see about getting some uh, some care packages sent out to your people. I think it would uh, help out quite a bit. Um, but you know, it's not just like Pinkney cookies or the the feel good box. Where did you get your feel good boxes from? Is there is there an organization or a company that does those? Huh? Is there? Are what do you mean? Well. We're put- we're putting them together. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I know that we had some care yeah. packages that were like uh, from there's a, there's a website or something out there. It's like, oh yeah, you can send a care package to a college student or something. So our company just went ahead and no, 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 Meg. Yeah, Megan and I are all doing it. Wow. Okay. We're getting the boxes. We're putting everything together and dang, adding like our own special touches to them and stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so they're from the heart then. They're very <laughs> much from the heart. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I didn't want to just like, I don't know. I want it to be fully customizable. Okay. That's nice. Plus there's a couple people that like I know are struggling with certain things that were nominated. So oh, we bought okay. things specifically to like them. Oh, that's good. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. That's, that's awesome. So uh, is there still time to nominate people or is the window closed? Yeah, I mean, we didn't leave, like, we didn't put a date or time on it to stop getting stuff. Okay. Uh, like, uh, nominations, so. Awesome. Um, We're just going to keep doing it until we feel like we've spent enough money, maybe. <laughs> I don't okay. Because we still need to, like, keep some for right. other stuff. Um, But, yeah. Okay. So, um. Oh. It'll be an executive decision when we stop. <laughs> yeah. No, that's understandable. Uh, so uh, just if anybody's like, oh, I want to find out about Pinkney cookies, you go to lovethesecookies.com. Um, I put a link in the show notes to that. But um, so uh, on my on my note, uh, so we didn't have InfoSec Camp Out 2020 this year because obviously COVID. Uh, so, we, you know, uh, King County, where uh, Seattle is located, is in what they call stage two, kind of a modified stage two. Uh, you could have camping happen, but it was only with groups of five or less and they had to all be family members so obviously uh we could not do a conference under those kinds of conditions other uh you know normal or otherwise so they gave us all of our money back uh this weekend actually would have been when we were supposed to do infosec camp out 2020 and i went ahead and got we got all our money back which is great so we didn't have to worry about losing any money in, in terms of venue or the barn or whatever that is we were using so i went ahead and reserved all the campsites for 2021 so uh you know as as the old saying is good god willing the crick don't rise we're going to have infosec camp out 2020 one uh at the same place we had it in 2019 and hopefully uh miss berlin will be able to join us then and we'll have us a nice vaccine and everybody will be able to sit around and talk about the 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 good old days of the before times uh you know when we had it in 2019 so uh there will be details coming out about that uh in the near future but i want to you know get with my board and uh uh, InfoSec Education Foundation and and get everything all you know started on that. But the venue has been bought, so uh, we're we're ready to go. That's pro- probably seventy five percent of the the whole issue. Um, so uh, look for more details on that as it's coming up, and it'll be I think the twenty seventh, twenty eighth, and 29th of August, twenty twenty one. So uh, you know, put a put a little soft pin in your uh, in your calendar there. So. Yeah, I can't wait to start seeing people again. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I think it's going to... The problem is, I think people will be cooped up for so long. Once we start seeing people, people are going to go nuts. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll see. We'll see. 
So, uh, Mr. Betcher, uh, we need to probably wrap this up now, but uh, do you have anything else uh, that you'd like to talk about? I don't think so. Okay. I appreciate uh, all of you coming on. Uh, Miss Miss Berlin, how would people find you? You talked about mental health hackers. Uh, how would they find out about you or your uh, your tabletop exercise organization? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R, or at, hacker, uh, at Hackers Health. Okay. And what's the, uh, what's the tabletop uh, website, uh, Twitter? Mm, we don't have a website or, well, I mean, we have like, uh, InfoSec Roleplay. InfoSec Roleplay? Okay. But we don't tweet, yeah, we don't tweet from that a whole lot. We have, uh, I, I think I mentioned that our name of our new company right the info it's like infosec training like solutions something something <laughs> Cybersecurity conference training LLC. that's it that's it uh <laughs> that's it <laughs> yeah uh but i think i can't remember what our our email address is it's like yeah i, I don't even say oh uh, you have it on the info, go to infosec role play easier. and i'm sure it'll be there somewhere you know <laughs> sure yep <laughs> anyway uh and your twitter is sure. your twitter is uh your personal twitter is oh i already said that oh okay cool sorry it all got jumbled together <laughs> mr Bedger, tell us uh, how people can find you and what you're doing what am i doing oh, i'm living the dream baby now my um website blog md.com awesome check it out and uh, Twitter is at Betcherpwned. My B- last name P W N E D. Right on. And you're uh, you're still doing the the log MD with uh, Mr. Hacker Hurricane Michael Goff, doing a lot of good yes. stuff. Awesome. Yes. Check okay. out the cheat sheets and all that stuff. Yep. So. And and so dare I ask, will there be an incident response podcast coming out soon? I don't know. We've been trying to do one every month, so we'll see. Okay. Right we'll see on. how it goes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, I do the InfoSec camp out. So we got uh, 2021 lined up, hopefully. Uh, I'm sure they'll call me going, you just reserved a bunch of campsites. What are you doing? Because they did that last year too. Uh, I also do a local meetup. <laughs> they do. They do. It's like, oh, we noticed you. That's funny. You booked half the campsite. Why are you doing that? And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> professional conference. Yes, we promise not to drink promise not to drink that was in quotey fingers uh, so uh i also do a local meetup here in the seattle area but uh since february we've been global uh virtual so you can join us for talks it's almost like a mini con every month uh i've tried to have one or two amazing sp- it's hard as fuck you have no idea yeah um so we have two speakers uh, this month. We have uh, Maurice Brown, who's going to be coming and talking about uh, his experiences uh, dealing with supply chain uh, issues. Uh, he works for a specific company that I won't talk about. Uh, you can find him online. He's a pwn ship, P-W-N-S-H-I-P. Uh, and uh, uh, the other gentleman uh, is Jorge. Oh, good. I know this one. Uh, he works for Scythe. Uh, CSEC East meetups uh, virtual on zoom. So you can go to meetup.com where on there, uh, Jorge or Achilles. Oh God. I hope I got that right. I really hate that. He's at Jorge or Achilles on Twitter. He's the co-creator of the C2 matrix and CTO of adversary emulation platform at scythe.io. Uh, so we're going to have him on talking, uh, there, you know, Maurice is here in Seattle, but Jorge's in like the East coast. So it, you can come and hang out. We start at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you can uh, join us. We'll be on Zoom. The Zoom is, of course, the break sex Zoom. So you can uh, hang out. We have a bunch of people. We always have a are you hiring or, you know, are you needing work or something like that kind of thing. So if you're looking for a job or you, you, you have a company and you are looking for people, we can definitely talk about that between speakers. Uh, and yeah, uh, meetup.com forward slash CSEC dash East, uh, or just, you know, do a search for CSEC East. It's Seattle security East, Seattle security. I run both of them now, so you can't not find it. Um, and yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brian break, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. The official, uh, break podcast is at break sec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. Uh, we have a Slack 
very active book club for the ad car stuff. I think we talked about earlier starts on September the 3rd. Like I said, go to smile.amazon or uh, go to the link in the show notes to get the ad car book. You can do the ebook or the, the dead tree version. Still have plenty of time to get involved with that. It'll be a short book for five weeks, I would imagine. And uh, I'm going to do that one and, and come to it as much as possible. So, uh, and it's a Thursday night, so uh, it's not, we're not going to try to do it on Mondays, I think. So, um, Thank you to all of our patrons. They help uh, with hosting, domain purchase, Zoom, and uh, Libsyn. Uh, so every month, uh, you know, we appreciate everybody who helps out with that, uh, you know, and, and helps spread the word and spreads uh, the educational, uh, you know, value of BreakSec. So i uh, got some exciting things coming up. Uh, I think we have a sponsor that is going to be able to pay us enough money to do uh, full transcriptions of the web of the podcast, which is one of the things that a lot of people have asked for. Uh, unfortunately, they're very expensive to do like 75 cents to a dollar and a half a minute per, uh, you know, for a podcast. So an hour long podcast is really expensive and we do it four to five times a month. So average is about $3,500 a year to be able to do that. So, uh, we've got, a company coming on to help some defray some of that cost. Um, so I'm um, looking forward to doing some interviews with them and we hope that you'll give them the time uh, because they're helping us, uh, you know, do that. So it's really great. So um, I don't have anything else. Uh, catch us on all, of our, all the major podcast platforms. Please leave comments there. Uh, we appreciate the word of mouth advertising that that gives us. And uh, that's it for this week on Breaking Down Security. Have a great week. Be kind to one another. Uh, remember, Black Lives Matter. Um, sorry to hear about Chad uh, Chadwick Bozeman. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to go have a quick walk, and then we're going to go watch uh, Black Panther again. And, uh, yeah, take care of yourselves. Be nice to one another. And uh, remember, you're the only you you have, so it's important for the mental health issues to take care of yourself. So have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey. hey, everyone. Rachel Toback here, chair of the board for Women in Security and Privacy, also known as WISP. And I want to tell you about an opportunity to get involved in the community. On Friday, June 26th, the security community came together to lift and amplify the stories and work of Black security and privacy practitioners on Twitter and LinkedIn through the hashtag Share the Mic in Cyber campaign, which was organized by Camille Stewart and Lauren Zabrick. In response to this campaign, we started raising funds for Najla, who was my partner in the campaign, also known as 4 underscore Q on Twitter, to sit for the PMP, OSCP, and CISSP. We ended up raising the $2,000 to cover Najla's expenses, and we're now moving on to cover as many training, certification, and learning or advancement expenses as possible, incurred by Black security and privacy practitioners in the Share the Mic and Cyber Group. As of right now, on July 6th, we have $16,000 raised and about $26,000 in needs for the community. Please consider a donation or a corporate sponsorship to cover these expenses. You can head on over to tinyurl.com slash sharewisp for our donation page, or you can go on our Twitter page, at wisporg, so you can see the full donation link yourself. You're security-minded, probably want to see the full URL. I get it. Thanks so much for taking action, and I'll see you on the internet.